Hello and welcome to the Magic of Podcast. Today, my special guest is a good friend of mine, Mr. David Penn. He is a magician, uh, illusionist actually. He's a consultant. He's a speaker. He's super well versed in, in, I would say, pretty much the gamut of magic um, and for a long time. Uh, how are you doing, David? I'm doing very well. I was just listening there to that list, and I, I was thinking you could sort of transcribe that to p- pay the money and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's the game, isn't it? That's the. In fact, that was the I'll game. Try, I'll try and make it work. Yeah, that was the game sort of... when I, My theory of first getting into magic was, as an actor, I was like, well, this is good because you get paid to perform... And you get paid up front and you're not chasing down these producers who, oh, it's all right, love, you know, we'll pay you. Don't worry, you'll get the money. And in magic's like, no, no, these are on my terms. So there's, there's always a bit of that with magic. And then suddenly you find, wow, this is an interesting business. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I first, I'll tell you where I first came across you was I knew of you. And then Max Somerset was on, I think it was in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah. And you well, pitched up. Th- well, it's funny you should say that. So let's change history a bit here, because Max has probably got this version that he tells you about, where <laughs> uh, you, you, one of your, Max, one of your closest friends, is telling everybody uh, that Max was there, and then I pitched up. Well, that was quite interesting, that show, because I was involved with the production side of it with 2020 television long before Max was involved, because Max wasn't going to be the sorcerer. It was actually going to be David Burglass. And David was going to be the sorcerer. I was going to be the teacher of the boys. And then uh, they were getting somebody in to be the teacher of the girls. And then everything got changed. David, after spending nearly every day on the phone with David, which was an experience in itself, planning a TV show, and I learned a lot, he unfortunately left the project. And then Max came in and became the sorcerer. But a lot of people don't know that it was meant to be David Burglass as the sorcerer. That's that's fantastic. Um, I can't remember if I'd heard that before like now it's setting off a lot of little bells it's an interesting thing it was it reminds me of seeing george clooney on i think it was on like barry norman you know film whatever it was back in the day and he was being interviewed and he was it was before he was like i mean he was pretty uber famous then but i don't think he was quite the the star well, it was pretty big but he was talking about those moments where you go for auditions and you know you're trying to get the part and that you know there's 10 people better than you who've gone in before you and then they've decided to offer it to Tom Cruise and they've decided to offer it to somebody else and somebody else and you're like fourth or fifth down the line and you can either be god I'm fourth or fifth down the line or you go fuck great I'm taking it there's my opportunity who cares who was before me it's me yeah, I, I I remember at the time I was very, very disappointed because I was meant to be the magic teacher and it was a larger role. And then Tarek Knight came in and they they liked the look of Tarek and it it ticked a few boxes as far as BBC television uh, were concerned at the time, which was explained to me by the production team. And uh, yeah, I was relegated to having one spot of street magic Uh, in every episode, which was quite good fun. We got to go out onto some interesting locations rather than staying at the house all the time. And then I got to be the (laughs) escapology expert. I have no idea how that happened. And then I was brought in as the the illusionist expert. And uh, we did the clear soaring in half on the show as well. And and it was great. But I just remember doing this full-sized epic illusion in this (laughs) <laughs> comparatively small room for Max and about eight kids. Yeah. And uh, it, it was like one of those really bad gigs. What, you know when you get an agent and they just do not understand, they've got a house party for five five people and they want a full-sized illusion show 
and they go, we want what you did on Britain's Got Talent. You say, no, it's going to be too overwhelming for your size of audience. You need a parlor show, but you get some agents going, no, this is a very high-end client. They want the big box stuff in their living room, and uh, yeah. And a team, a team of, I need to get my team in. Um, we're going to have to fly in some rigging <laughs> in, your, in your lounge. <laughs> they 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 think it's the best thing for them at the time, but they they just don't understand that. As you know, close up magic can have just as much of a positive impact on an event when it's done in the right way with the right setting. It's all about scale, isn't it? You've got a small audience. If it's one on one, you blow them away with sleight of hand and mind reading a big box trick is never going to work when it's right at the side of them and that particular time didn't you have a dvd street magic street magic secrets yes and uh, that was that came out after sorcerer's apprentice and also after britain's got talent so a production company got in touch with me that did want to make a dvd for the general public teaching easy tricks it actually ended up as two dvds and it sold really well and it was a little bit of a surreal experience to go in hmv at the time and see you on a little uh, cardboard box display with uh, your face on there so where did magic begin for you i mean how did you get into magic was it was it were you totally obsessed was it one track or were there other kind of artistic pursuits or, or other things that you were interested in? So, so I was always interested in magic from a young age. I know it's a cliche, but it was my granddad that used to muck about and do the odd magic trick for me. Uh, he used to do a trick, and it was probably this moment of magic that really inspired me to be a magician. And I was going to write a one-man show about it, and I had a really beautiful ending for it, which can't happen now, unfortunately. But the ending was beautiful. And the the story stems back to my granddad making a toy soldier disappear, like the type of toy soldiers that were in Toy Story, the green ones that would walk like this. And he made it disappear with sleight of hand. And when I got home, it was on the kitchen table. And it took me years to work out it was my dad that obviously sneaked the toy soldier home. And then when I uh, got home, it was on the table. And uh, I was going to do a show. I planned to do sort of a smaller scale show and... Obviously, it's important, as we know, to reveal something about yourself during a performance. That's always going to register really well with the audience. So being a question like yourself that you get asked all the time, how did you get started? I thought it would be a good thing to call the show Moments of Magic and talk about the moments of magic that inspired your journey and made you want to become a magician. So I was going to tell the story about my grandfather and I was going to tell the story about it was my dad that sneaked the toy soldier onto the table. And then I was going to do the whole show. I was going to make the toy soldier disappear at the start of the show, intimate parlor show environment. And then at the end of the show, um i would finish but in the middle of the audience and i just had this idea that at the end of the show the light there'd be a lighting change in the room or sort of control with q lab very minimal lighting plot but it would go a little bit darker in the room and then there would be a single sort of profile go up on the table where i'd been performing all night i'm in the middle of the audience now small audience and the toy soldier was there but nobody knew how it got there. And I had an idea to write it up for a magic publication and actually say, try and figure out how I did it and then sort of turn the page and you decide whether you were right. Did, did I do it the, the same way? And the, the idea I had was to tell the audience at the start of the show that it was my dad taking the toy soldier home and putting it on the table and acting as surprised as I was. 
And then the idea I had was my dad was in the audience. And as the audience gathered round me, he would put it on the table. <laughs> and I really, really loved this concept of telling the audience what the secret was and then fooling them with the very, very same method. Yeah. And I thought it would be an interesting thing for magicians to read about. It was something that I planned to do, but I can't do it now. You could do, you know, you could do the the kind of, like Copperfield does that story about his dad uh, in the, you know, the illusion show. So you could kind of stretch it a little bit in terms of the reality of it. I think yeah. it's a great idea. I, it, the, the, I really wanted to do it. I wanted to do it for myself and I wanted to do it for, but maybe I was even going to reveal the secret at a later date. And so, cause like teller says so many times about magic is just like guarding an empty box. There's nothing real. The secrets aren't that important. And I think it would have been a beautiful thing to actually show people how magical something can be but actually reveal the secret later. Maybe everybody comes to the show, but then everybody sees a bit of footage about how you actually did it. And that that secret is more beautiful than the actual presentation itself. I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if it's possible to remain in the magic circle and do that sort of thing. But like I said, it won't be happening now because unfortunately my father did pass away about yeah. six months ago. Oh, and I don't want to do it now because of that. Right. Um, it brings up a lot of interesting things. Let's just stay on the – because I'd like to talk about exposure. I'd like to talk about secrets um, because that's that's changed. I mean, we, but I just want to just stay on this idea, uh, just kind of like your development in magic, because I think that's really integral and interesting, because you've really gone on a journey into the type of magician you are, the things that you, I, I think the things that you value, how you developed as a performer, also how you, I, I, I was at a gig um, with this uh, charlatan producer, which you were at. <laughs> Remember that one? I'm trying to think. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do know the one you mean. Yes. I was going to be in this in this uh this film. Um this guy was a complete con artist. Um, I, I follow Liz, Lizzie Cundy on uh Instagram and ev every time I see a picture from her I think about that night and how drunk she was and that kind of thing. And I remember <laughs> It was kind of for me. It was a big. I, actually, it was. It was round about. My father passed away. Around. It was round about that time as well. And I remember there were a couple of things. Firstly, you were there, and you were there as a guest, which was unusual. Yeah. And you came over to me. You went, "This is so unusual. I'm just getting to enjoy myself, and you're doing magic." And you kind of stood off and watched me. And you came over to me at one point, and you said, "I really enjoyed that. It was nice to see a worker who understands." what it is to perform in a close-up environment, what's important. I love watching magic. I love watching a great magician, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate somebody who is in the trenches doing it. And it is so rare, isn't it, that we get to be the ones at an event, sit back, know what the performer's kind of doing, even though you were performing very original material. I was, I could kind of watch the audience at the same time. And you're getting so much enjoyment from seeing people in a very high class environment, as it was that evening, reacting to, to magic, reacting to something that you love. And I think sometimes you need that. You need to see somebody else to affirm to, to yourself that magic is a good thing to be doing because I think we all go through those negative thoughts every now and then. What do people really think of me when I'm doing, when I'm playing around with packs of cards and phones and they're, they're saying, what do you do for your day job? And 
you do, you do kind of think to yourself sometimes, um, what do people think of me? And then you have a night like that where you got to walk away and I got to listen to what they were saying. And it, it's great. And it just affirms that in the right hands, magic is a very powerful form of entertainment. I remember. And it's certainly respected. I remember you... you specifically it was exactly what you've just stated because there was a table that I went up to and I think some of it was awkward something wasn't right something was off and I I can't remember if I did my bit or I didn't do my bit and you 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 said to me you handled that quite well because you you don't and it made you think about it as well because he said you don't know what they were just talking about they were just talking about somebody who died of cancer or some illness Crikey, I do remember that now. And, uh, yeah, and, again, we don't think about these, that as a close-up entertainer, you suddenly penetrate somebody's life and go, well, hey, here we go with the magic, folks. And uh, as we've already mentioned on, on this podcast, you don't know what somebody's going through at a particular time in their life. You don't know, especially when they're out for dinner. They could be discussing divorce or Something which is something that I did once when I was out for dinner with my ex-wife. We discussed divorce. I could just imagine a close-up magician coming over at that point. Yeah, you, you just don't know. Yeah, you don't know what's going. And it's it, it, and it, it it comes back to this interesting thing. Um, so obviously, I, I it comes up a lot when I talk about this. But being in LA and having the opportunity to perform at the castle, which you've performed at, yeah. Um, it's a very different experience because, especially in the UK generally, as a close-up performer, we are adjunct to the evening. We are not the evening. So we yeah. exactly have that problem of interrupting the death conversation or the illness conversation or the divorce conversation and going in there and go, hi, I'm the magician. Here, take this, do that. And you know, oh, God, please leave me alone. And um, whereas when you do something at the castle – People have come to see magic. So, well, you you start the expectation if you're at the castle and you're an in, you're an international act. You've got your British accent. Uh, you're putting on your best Hugh Grant accent to keep uh, the people at the castle happy. And you start, and that expectation is is up there. And actually, you can only go down from there. <laughs> you might be able to go up a little bit, maybe. Maybe if they've not seen close-up magic happen to them and it's their first time at the castle and something happens to them personally, maybe you can raise it slightly from that expectation point. But certainly with a UK corporate audience, especially in London, the expectation is very low to start with. And it's almost like, how dare you? You cannot possibly be worthy of my time. Mm. And you have to climb that hill during the performance. And you might be in the middle of a 8, 12-minute set, and you might get to sort of the 6, 7-minute point in that set where you're just about to go into the last routine. And it's only then where you kind of see a turning point where the audience goes, well, actually, it's quite good, this, isn't it? And then it's almost time to move on to the next table at a gala dinner event and start the whole bloody process again and start that climb again and it's something i've tried to get over by having tent cards on the table so hopefully people read the cv and read a little bit of information before you get there so in essence you've had a little bit of an introduction even if they've read it themselves and hopefully it can raise that expectation. So rather than you just being the entertainment that's kind of like a secondary thing, it seems like a more specialist thing that the organisers are really proud to have you there. And I've had tent cards for a while now and just put three tent cards on every table before the gig started. And I have noticed a serious increase in the positive engagement at the moment I come to the table. That's a wonderful uh, almost, idea. Almost to the extent of you audibly hear people going, oh, he's here. 
Which is that which you don't get. It's that advantage that I've always found when you do the drinks reception and then you do the tables, or you do the drinks reception and then you do a show, because you've set up. Oh, this guy's good. You you know, yeah. if someone hasn't seen, they go. Oh, you've got to see Dave. This guy's amazing. He's oh, he's doing a show. Fantastic. He did this amazing thing. Oh, I can't wait to see that. And Joshua J was talking about it on a previous podcast, and I thought you know, uh, from a scientific anal- analytical basis where they'd looked at giving people, um, uh, giving them the, their CV resume beforehand, you know, the introduction and having a good introduction to a, sh- a show, then having the performer come on and the difference that the audience felt when they had that introduction yeah. was palpable. Whereas, and, and he talked about even doing the... Um, uh, his conventions and you know the the the, the act coming saying you know what would you like what introduction oh whatever it doesn't really matter of course it really really matters yes it does um and, and in the same way if you're doing close up magic with a smaller cabaret spot for a, a room of say about 80 people uh in a hotel suite if you're doing the close-up magic first, if you talk to them and you tell them that you're going to be doing a, a cabaret show and it's going to take about 40 minutes and uh, uh, make sure you can see. And uh, don't worry, if you want to move your chairs around, feel free to do that. And you tell them all this as part of the close-up magic performance. When it comes to the announcement for the little cabaret spot, you see all the room suddenly shift into a better position Mm -hmm. because they've enjoyed the close-up. Whereas if you were just booked as a cabaret performer, you would still have to fight that little bit to gain that attention in the room. But if you've got that perceived introduction by going round and meeting everybody and convince them that maybe the cabaret is worth seeing as well because they've seen something interesting happen at their table, then it works in exactly the same way. But the tent cards for me, big difference. One of the best things I ever did. That's a br- I'm, that is a tip. That is definitely a tip for people. Um, yeah, because I remember having a, a – it reminds me of a corporate cabaret. It was in Kensington in – Oh, it was that venue. Um, can't remember. Upstairs, right at the top of the building there. It was one we used to all do. Anyway, they, and they had me in the brochure, and it changed everything. Definitely. Yeah. You could feel it. You could feel the, the palpable difference of it. Did you um, – so when you started with Magic, was it illusions that you were, that you were into, or was it the close-up, or was it a bit of both? So I started – I, I just want, I, w- I had a proper job when I left school, and that was to do with my dad. I was living with my dad at the time. My dad said, right, you've got to start paying board, and if you want to get a car, you need to save up. And obviously the goal was to eventually leave home. And I was on the management training program of Toys R Us, <laughs> and uh, I – got given an amazing opportunity. There's this lady called Tina Mumford and she, who I'm still friends with now on Facebook uh, from my area of Northampton. She was, she had a job at the theater, which was the Derngate theater. And the Derngate is a pretty sizable theater. It's sort of 1600 and it had a list stars. Where is the pantomime? Where's where's the Derngate? In Northampton. Northampton. So about 50 miles north of London. Uh, But quite a big town. Panto was at its height. And I think this was 1992. And Tina knew I was a magician. I was trying to just... I was just in that point where I was trying to turn semi-pro into full-time pro. Because I was at Toys R Us for a year during the day up until 5 o'clock. And then I was trying to get... uh, children's parties at the weekend and close-up bookings in the evening and I did a show for Tina's I think it was her 21st or maybe her 18th and it was at the theatre because she worked there so it was in a function room downstairs and I turned up and I was fascinated with canes and candles and I did an okay manipulation act at that time and 
will alter Jean-Michel Jarre music. How old, are uh, you? How old are you at this point? Probably around 18, 19. So I had right. the, the Oxygen going and the Jean-Michel Jarre, which I think is quite funny because I'm obviously friends with David Jarre now. Yeah. I don't think he realises what a massive fan I am of his dad. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I went and did this gig and the manager of the theatre was there. And he said, we've got a panto this year. And he had connections in circus as well. So we're going back to early 90s. It wasn't as taboo as it is now to have circus animals. And he had con connections and he wanted to do the, uh, the vanishing elephant. But I convinced him to do the appearing elephant because appearance is better than a vanish. And the idea was he wanted to parade the elephant through the town as a promotional thing for the panto. And then he wanted it in Cinderella. And the idea was that I was the act. This is local talent, but I was going to be the act in the ballroom performing a little bit of sort of manipulation magic for sort of seven, eight minutes while the all the rest of the cast became static and kind of watched because it was the ballroom enter uh, entertainment. Then the elephant would appear and then it was like, oh my goodness, there's the elephant. And then the clock would chime midnight and Cinderella would realise that she'd been uh distracted by the magic and she would head off home drop the slipper and that was going to be the end of act one so potentially i was given this huge opportunity as a young magician i wasn't even doing illusions then as such to go into this major production where i would be able to do my act work on it definitely have the money to justify going full time and keeping my dad happy and I gave up my job at Toys R Us. I pretty much set up residence in the shop, the woodworking shop behind the Derngate. I would go most days whilst they built the scenery, which was um, sort of trees on both sides, which you could see through to the backdrop. And then we were going to hold this banner up and the, the elephant was going to appear in between. <laughs> uh, outside of sort of the ballroom area just and basically I had this call sometime in October the thing was finished it wasn't painted all the scenery was done but it wasn't quite finished and we had this call in October time the council changed their ruling about live animals on stage and all of a sudden, the elephant idea was completely out, couldn't happen. And the whole thing was dead in the water. So I'd left my job. And yeah, I want, I thought I'd got this security of this fantastic job. So I was biding my time and just using my savings. But thankfully, there was an agency called All Sorts run by a local guy called uh, Royston and his wife, Meg, that were very supportive at the time. And they started giving me lots of children's work. And at the time, it was just bread and butter money. And I really enjoyed it. I used to love doing children's parties. And I was very lucky to win the UK Children's Entertainer of the Year, which was a great thing to win as well. But the turning point was a major venue opened in Northampton called the Chicago Rock Cafe. I became very friendly with the manager there. And Wednesdays and Thursdays, I was able to go and perform close-up magic. And that, over a period of about, of about three years, six hours a week of performing in the trenches was where I learned my craft as a magician. I was able to get all the DVDs from l and Publishing, study David Williamson and Tommy Wonder. And if there was something that inspired me, I'd got six hours of practice slash rehearsal slash live performance that I could go and do that week, but still earn the money as a full-time pro now from the children's magic and not have to worry too much about moving out and paying for my own place. Mm -hmm.
that's where it all started. That's how my career started. That's 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 fascinating. I mean, that's that <clears throat> in the trenches thing is so important. Um, I used to um, cover for uh, Dan Alexander at the um, uh, Frantoyo restaurant in Kings Road, and, and I would be their resident quite often. And I will always say that that's where I learned the most. I just there's no question about it because you know those moments, and especially. The American experience is not this. I was talking to Paul Draper uh, when he came to England. He was asking me about corporate. And I told him some stories. And he was like, you could never say that in America. You couldn't say that. I actually could say it in America because I'm British. I can get away with it. But some of the things and the, 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 that people have shouted at me or tried it on. And, and it's about how you take it and respond. Yeah. And I think when you first start off you're caught out in some, sometimes it's very aggressive with the Brits and you think that that's, you can take it personally. And as you kind of experience it more, you can find the comedy in it and throw it back at them. And quite often when you do, they, it turns, what you learn is how to, it, actually this is the kind of magic is you learn how to transform someone's um, person, not personality, but perception of dealing with you and and you yeah. turn a, 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 an aggressive person or seemingly aggressive uh, person into a child and i you know i, I, I you know uh, funnily enough when i started um you know max um was one of my uh, kind of a mentor really and i remember seeing him in a restaurant and he did um lasander a uh, chain um, tri- you know where it gets your fingers get uh, you tie your fingers up yeah that's right and you, yeah. you get tied to chain the, breaker the chain i think breaker. it's called chain breaker and you yeah. get tied to the bag and the chair and he did this with this this woman and she was a lawyer i'll never forget it she was in her 40s and she was just so you know finickety and looking at the chain and being really awkward and then he did the magic and she went oh Oh, gone. And suddenly, I just saw her turn into a 10 year old. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was a moment of revelation and incredible power. Um, the power of what, you know, the value and power of what magic can do and reconnect, rekindle that moment of astonishment as a cynical adult that you know you think people have lost because everything is you know the internet is magic but uh, it's the internet it just does this thing and we get all this information and and suddenly they see something so simple and so so emotional and it just changes and you know for me that was the that that amazing moment of realization of what what it can do and- i think as performers we we underestimate like somebody like yourself Paul that's been a performer for years is the phrase going with the flow is probably pretty apt here but you have this huge flow diagram in your mind and you know you're going to start up here with your your opening effect and you know you've got to get to the end effect but anything can happen anything and the when you first start, you only know this route straight down. You only know that you're going to start here and it's going to end up here. But when you've been a performer, I don't know, 10 years or so plus, all these things have happened. Everything's happened. So you know how to move around that flow diagram and still get the audience to that end point. But literally Anything can happen along the way, including you completely changing your set, adding in extra effects, watch deals, loading things in people's pockets, whatever you feel like doing at the time, because you've got that experience over the years. And I think people probably underestimate when they see a world class close up magician like yourself, the fact that you are able to jazz so well with your performance and think, ah, maybe maybe this person deserves this effect. And maybe you weren't going to do that, but mid-performance you realise that 
you actually need to flip your performance on its head and go in a completely different direction. You still might get to that end point, which is that final applause, but you're actually jazzing with your audience and analyzing your audience throughout the whole performance. And that's the skill. And that that's certainly what I saw in you that night in London. The fact that you were seemingly jazzing, but you were taking them on a journey, but things were happening organically. You were having conversations and that's the skill of a good performer. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, it's, it's interesting in terms of scripting. Do you, how far, I mean, I always see scripting as incredibly important understanding your scripting certainly when it comes to parlor and stage. But it's a strange phenomenon, Magic, again, because it's you've broken the third wall. You're not just talking to, and you know, even if you're on stage, you're not just talking to the back at the back of the theater. You're not proclaiming. You want to interact. And there's a certain yeah. give and take, and there's a certain, you know, it's kind of like the heckler. You don't want the heckler, but you like the banter. And... Um, but I always see improvisation within these things as you improvise between the lines. So you have the lines, but there's space between the lines where you can improvise. And if you know what you're doing, that stuff takes care of itself and you can come out of the script and you can come back into the script. And like you say, I love that idea of this kind of Venn diagram, this kind of this picture of all these experiences going on and you drawing from them. And then again, something, there's those occasions where something happens, something goes wrong, someone throws something at you. And even the with wor- all that The worst thing, the worst thing for me is when something really good happens, say a third into the performance, and you know that what's just happened is gold. You may have used a line that's got, you've used a line in a slightly different way and it's got such a great reaction. And you, you're you actually doing the rest of the act and all the way throughout your act, you're thinking, I've got to remember this bit. I must remember that. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in the car driving home going, what was that bit <laughs> that I said there? And sometimes it's just lost. It's lost forever. And if you've got another gig, maybe the next night in succession, it will bring it back to you. That muscle memory will bring it back. But it's very frustrating when that happens. And obviously in a close up environment, there's not normally that opportunity to video or record your event as much as we record your gig as um, as much as we'd probably like to yeah do you i, mean, I was going to ask you do you record um what you do uh, or, or did I you try to record every cabaret show even if it's leaving my phone somewhere in the room so i can just go over it but the cabaret show for me scripting wise at this stage in my career is more important. I tend to add more material into my cabaret or it's always evolving, always changing. I'm always getting more excited about certain routines. There are routines that I've had for years that will work under any circumstances and Probably I shouldn't have done this, but I get bored and take them out of the act after a few years and I will replace it rather selfishly with something that I'm enjoying working on. And I'll start to develop script and work on what the pattern line, what the hook is to get people as interested in this potential material that that makes me interested in it. So there's a lot of material. The start of lockdown I had to literally stop myself creating material because I had that sort of honeymoon period of lockdown where I was thinking, this is brilliant. I know that I'm not going to have a gig for three, four months. I can script some really new routines and I can go and perform them and try them out as soon as lockdown comes to an end in August time. That's what I was thinking at the time. But the trouble is, the way I work, if I've got new material, especially new bits of script, 
I like to put sort of five or ten minutes in to an already established spot uh, and, and an established set of material. I could never do a whole show now and not rely on those bankers, if you like, all the way throughout the performance. And it got to a point where I'd written 40 minutes of new material and it actually became pointless because what I needed to do was take those five, 10 minute elements of all this new material that were individual routines, go and put them with all the bankers and work it in and workshop this material. And there's probably three, four years worth of work that I've made myself by creating that 30, 40 minutes of material that I want to try out because it's unfair of your audience of, uh, to the audience, in my opinion, to just go and try all new stuff. Because I think if you're a pro and you're getting booked by a company to do a great job, you owe your audience your best work. And although it's challenging and important to you to stay fresh and try something new, the gig has to be a success. You've got to have the client getting great feedback from his audience saying that was fantastic. And the only way to do that is to have those bankers, all that experience and work that material in very, very slowly. So it got to a point where I'd done too much and I just had to stop. That's that. I, I think that that that's fundamental that's so i totally agree with that and it's something i i I, suddenly all these pictures of these events that i've done where there's one trick that i really want to put in and sometimes i don't put it in because these are really important clients and they know that you're shit hot and you've you've been you you want to fire at that level because you want to be rebooked and you want all their all their friends to book you and so it's really really important so you can't have that trick that can go wrong because and and not necessarily technically go wrong but it just doesn't flow it doesn't work so i you know i remember introducing uh, stand up monty back in the day and that's a major part of my set now but when i first started it it's so technical you there's know, a lot to remember. There's a lot <laughs> with to, stand up, Mark. Yeah, and I yeah. and I used to forget bits of you know. Even when I'd done it, I had to kind of revise it and go back to it. And I was doing uh, and even recently Hitchcock with the, for Joshua uh, Joshua Jay's Hitchcock something I introduced and I really wanted to put it in, but I knew that there were loads of dangers of putting it in. And in fact, I did it once and it went horrendously wrong. But fortunately, it was in like the cellar at the Magic Castle. So it was basically the, what was wonderful there is you've got your you've got your um, your kind of open mic experience. You've got those opportunities to really work in and hone those tricks. And it's like you say, it's almost like in order to get that new forty minutes, you want to take those little nuggets out, pop them in your act that works hone in those little tricks, then take them back out, then restructure it and create this new 40 minutes. But at least then you've worked in those tricks and those effects and that rhythm. And then you can start fashioning um, that show because you're not thinking about the technicality of getting those tricks to work or feeling how they're going to work with an audience. And then you can start, and like you say, it's like this three or four years work. So, I've got a a tip for anybody doing this, and I'm sure it must be something you've done yourself. I'm honest with my audience sometimes, and especially at a corporate event, they love it because you can normally tie it into the message of progressing, always evolving. And normally if you're at a conference and you're doing some kind of energizer or keynote they're actually talking about the progression of something so you can in your set actually confess to the audience that the line i use i say if you google my name david penn two n's and or you go on youtube you'll probably find videos and you'll see that i'm also a creator of magic that i develop magic for other magicians and this means that i have to constantly try out new material And I have something, this is in extra to the normal show. This is a complete extra 
do you mind if I try something out now that's absolutely brand new that nobody's ever seen before? And actually, you'd be surprised how many people, especially at a corporate level, will shift forward in their seat because they've had this underlying honesty You've not gone into it with this big time script and gone in 1922, somebody invented this. And and now I'd like you to examine this because you started with this heart on the sleeve underlying honesty about how you feel about your performance at this point. You can actually put the audience in a really appreciative mood. And the funny I'm laughing because sometimes you can be working for. BT analysts is something that comes to mind, uh, which is something that I did. And I was at dinner later on in the day because quite a few of these conferences, you end up spending all day with the delegates, maybe doing an energizer after lunch and then doing close up magic in the evening. And I found I was getting the most unbelievable feedback about this one particular routine that I'd put in. But they felt obliged to give me feedback. Do you know, I really liked your new trick, the new one. And they they tell me, yeah, that bit really threw me and it's really good. And you could tell you hadn't done it very much, but it was really good to see. And it made them really appreciative and less judgmental. And for quite some time, I guess it's like Siegfried and Roy with the tiger. There's a lot to learn from uh, the tiger bringing it out. Tonight's his first time in front of an audience and everybody would applaud. And I had an illusion called, I've still got it, called Op Art. And for about three years now, uh, I call it abstract so people can't uh, put the name in YouTube and see other people doing it. But for about three or four years now, certainly when I was doing it and closing Champions of Magic, I would introduce that illusion as the first time we'd ever performed it. And works really well with an audience. It's a really good presentational hook is to just be honest with the audience. In the in the case of abstract, I wasn't being entirely honest. It was just an interesting hook. They were seeing something brand new. They were seeing something that had never been on TV before. So I was able to introduce it that way and get people interested. But in the same way with corporate style material, you can still have that underlying honesty. And just the fact that you're changing pace with your presentation in that way, I think does give that audience that really interesting emotional hook and also people like a magician being honest and heart on the sleeve because so much of it for the audience is perceived as bravado (laughs) that's uh it was something i discussed with steve valentine when i was putting my show together out here um i was doing my stage show and working that up and i would start with a version of um the Woody Arrogan trick, you know, the beginning of in book in English, yeah, the ripping the cards. And, um, but I changed it to, um, I actually have a collection of programs, theater programs, and they're genuine. They're all plays that I've seen over the years. So I, I, um, scanned them and made these little, uh, leaflets with all these different programs from like Les Mis, which I saw when I was 12. And, and, uh, you know, it was the original one at the Barbican. And so I, I, I have that narrative connection to it, which is authentic, which is true. And there were things, I mean, I can remember the producers with Lee Evans uh, uh, and uh, uh, Nathan Lane and uh, some amazing plays that I saw. Um, Michael Gambon in Arthur Miller, um, Death of a Salesman. I mean, just incredible. Wow. But, so, you know, that's adding this kind of frisson and, and energy and, and, and something interesting. And I would say I was very lucky. I went to Westminster School. I used to go to plays. I used to go all, every week. I used to go with my mum to the theatre. And Steve said to me, that's great, but why don't you throw it back at the audience? Why don't you ask them the question? And I thought, well, that's interesting. And and so instead of saying, I was lucky, you turn around to the audience and say, have you ever been inspired by something? Can you remember a teacher that inspired you? 
Was there something that you saw that got you into the thing that you do now or heightened your interest? So suddenly the audience there go, oh, yes, I remember that. Do you remember Mr. So-and-so? And, And, (laughs) you know, do you remember, oh, God, I remember watching The Godfather for the first time or whatever it was. And so suddenly they're all sitting there thinking about themselves and now they throw it back to you. And I th- that was a game changer. And that relates to this kind of thing that you're talking about where you're creating rapport and a, a connection with people that's absolutely genuine. And what you see, the problem with magicians that you see is they're not genuine. They're, yeah. And they're not good enough actors to play that character. So... I'm not one who believes that you've got to be loved, you've got to be likable. You can be unlikable, but you've got to be kind of charmingly unlikable. There's got to be, you know, there's that, it's that Tony Soprano thing. You know, we love Tony Soprano. Would you want him to be in your life? Not really, because it's a bit, (laughs) you know, you might have a great meal and get some money, but you might, you know, end up with your head cut off and thrown off a boat. So I'd hate to I'd hate to experience what he would say if you went up to do close up magic at his table in that <laughs> restaurant they're always in. I don't think he'd have the time for it. Oh, I remember. You know, I I, I remember. I, I I have to use very bad words, but there was a there was a, I remember being on a boat doing a boat gig once, and um, this uh, the. <laughs> the guy i went up to this guy and i did a a thought of card in pocket routine and they were all kind of bruisers they were like boom like this and this guy went oh mate that was fucking amazing oi tommy come over here come and you gotta meet paul he's fucking amazing he's fucking amazing and this guy comes over to me and he goes listen mate if you make a cunt out of me i'll fucking have you (laughs) and i said sir i never make a cunt out of anyone anyway think of a card and and i did the trick and he went oh that was amazing oh all right paul all right you're my mate now you know and um uh it that that's true that's genuine you know but that being able to deal with that moment comes from your graph yeah it absolutely comes from your graph of experience. Um, I think, I think it, it, from any walk of life, wherever you come from, especially being a close-up magician and ma- male audiences in particular, they seem to respond to sleight of hand. And there's always that thing which can convert anybody once they realise that you've got a certain element of skill. I doubt, like I've seen your set, I've seen you work, but if you'd have brought out a plastic toy shop magic trick and put it on the table, you probably would have left that establishment uh, <laughs> and got thrown out by those same guys. <laughs> and it's, it's, they, they made a judgment about you at that point. And if you perform the right sort of material, it can convert anybody and turn them on to magic. Your experience as a performer has taken you everywhere. I mean, it's open doors. It's it's you've you've. I know you've met amazing people. I know you've travelled extensively. Um, and I was thinking a couple of things. Those memorable moments that have happened to you, but also you're in the magic circle. You've brought it up. It's important to you. It's something, well, there's two things here. Um, During lockdown and and this experience, for me, it's brought home this amazing um, friendship and fraternity that we have that I feel so blessed and lucky to be in because, you know, we don't see each other all the time, but we kind of do. I mean, we, we... you know, being a member of the Magic Circle when you're in England, 
you're there every week or, you know, as good as, and we hang out, we go for dinner. We, we've got people who we can talk about magic with. You've got people who you can call on from, you know, I love that moment when you're coming back from a gig and you get a call from a magician or, you know, <laughs> yes, it's great. Isn't it? You're driving yeah. back or you're driving back and you're just, you're, you just, all that stuff's going through your head and you call up your magic friends and you go, oh, I just did this gig and this happened. This happened. <laughs> you said it together. <laughs> this happened. Yeah. And it's, you know, what a privilege to have that and to have these, you know, with the recent um, Magic Circle event, the Magic Circle Unlocked, I thought that was great. And just the amount of people who you kind of know and, you know, it's it's amazing what does it mean to you the the magic circle in general Mm. well i can only say that it goes back to the very first magic books that i read and you would turn to the back and you would see dealers listed and it normally had the address of who to contact at the magic circle that was christopher pratt in my day and it made it a very aspirational thing to be a member of the magic circle unfortunately it's not the same these days and even though i'm on the council i'd be the first to admit that i'm very saddened that that lack of prestige seems to be diminishing all the time as far as the perception of the british public goes It used to be that every single TV magician, be it David Burglass or whoever was appearing on a news broadcast or a talent show, it would seemingly always mention that they were a member of the Magic Circle or not. It was seen as a badge of quality. And me, myself, I still see it that way as that badge of quality. And especially when working for clients of a certain age, I think they perceive it the same way. But I do think it's diminishing. It's something as a council member, I'm always I've always got it in the back of my mind. How do, how do we stop that graph from going down and raise that profile of the magic circle? And it's important to me in 1994 when I started to work on the close up magic more and it was in a direction I was moving in at that point. It was an aspiration of mine to win the Magic Circle Close-Up Magician of the Year. It was like the top thing. It was all I was aiming for, and I couldn't believe it. I went in, and it was at the Victory Services Club back then. We didn't have the headquarters, but I won it. And I remember Ali Bongo coming up to me after, which was mind-blowing in itself, because I'd only ever seen Ali on TV, and he was he was a caricature in real life. And he came up to me and he went, that was brilliant. Your energy, that was so good. That was brilliant. By the way, who the hell are you? (laughs) And it was just such a great comment on the night. It was like, where have you come from? Because I I didn't used to go to the circle all the time, but I was a member. I came down then and winning that competition changed my life because I, 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 the way I describe it, I went from old Citroen Diane to brand new Sierra within the space of six months. Uh, (laughs) And that was because at a time, pre-internet, email was only just becoming a thing. You had to make connections with agents, and that would involve ringing them up, having a chat with them, telling them about how suitable you were for an event, and then maybe sending a brochure in the post. And it was only from 1994 onwards, that I had something that I could sell that set me apart from any other magician that may be hired for a prestigious event. And as a result of that award, that one particular award, I moved from just local gigs to dealing with extremely high-end London agents working in areas like Park Lane at all the hotels and that kind of thing. So for me, winning that award was a huge turning point in my career. Being a member of the Magic Circle was just something that I aspired to and always aspired to from the days that I was just an amateur magician practicing magic in my bedroom. And it still 
means that much to me. Um, I would just like to see it mean as much to the British public. Do you think that's a problem with the way magic is being fed to people now, really? I mean, there's there's two things with... It's, it's kind of... It's, it's... With the magic circle, it is an amateur and professional organization. So therein lies the rub. We have professionals and amateurs who are part of the organization and there's a um you know people volunteer to do stuff there it's not a kind of paid gig per se um so that i mean that there there is that problem in that you can there are people who can go out as members of the magic circle and not be uh full full pro performers um what and what does it mean you know with the, with the advent of the instagram magician and the youtube magician does it remain relevant it doesn't remain certainly doesn't remain relevant to their audience i don't think i think there's lots of ways how the magic circle could be more relevant going forward an issue that i've raised at a recent agm that seemed to have the support of a lot of people and i've actually joined uh, a, a committee headed up by past president Scott Penrose at the Magic uh, Circle, and that's to actually increase the profile of our competitions. Something I've spoken about recently is we've got a great competition which has been going for a long time. The close up, uh, the the Young Magician of the Year, which is a, a stage competition, and lots of top magicians featured in that competition over the years and then went on to have very sort of established Mm. uh, careers in the magic business. But the event at the moment is every two years. So one thing I've suggested we do is have young close-up magician of the year. But these competition in the year in between, but these competitions are all very well, but We need to work better. We need to work smarter that when we've got an event like this, we work with maybe a PR company. We work with local television companies and we actually shout about it ourselves. The close-up magician of the year for the Magic Circle needs to be a red carpet event. You need to be a celebrity to be in that room and watch that competition and, heaven forbid, be asked to be one of the judges, to be at a level as... Uh, in the entertainment industry to be asked to be a judge of that competition. And I think we need to educate people that these competitions and these events are extremely prestigious. Mm -hmm. And that's going to start with us as an organization to host that event in a better, larger way. And One thing that I raised, and I said it publicly, so I'm not breaching any sort of council privilege here. One thing that I said at the AGM two years ago was we were relying too much on the building, which is a perfect lecture facility. It's fantastic. But although there's a stage there, although there's curtains, although there's wings and there's lights up, It really is just a lecture facility. It's not a great theater. I know we use it for theatrical events, but it's not a great theater. And for the Magic Circle Stage Magician of the Year or the Young Magician of the Year on stage, I don't think the venue is big enough. And I think we should be aiming to not be as complacent as we have been in the past because convenience does breed complacency, Mm -hmm. unfortunately. And we've got this very convenient venue and I think it's made us very complacent with regards to the scale of our events. Whereas I think we should be working a lot harder to get into a much better, bigger, prestigious theatre, maybe in the West End of London. And also there are some fantastic large-scale illusionists in the magic circle that don't get the opportunity to do the best possible show that they can do to win 
the Magic Circle Stage Magician of the Year. And I always think that's a little bit of an injustice to have that award, which is actually very prejudicial against illusionists, which is something that's very close to my heart, because we've got some fantastic entertainers that are illusionists in the Magic Circle. But at the moment, as it stands, there is no opportunity for them to win that award, a prestigious award from the Magic Circle, and further their career in the same way I did as mm-hmm. a close-up magician. It reminds me of the uh, the international convention, you know, their their gala show. It should feel like that. It should have that that range. That that that. And it's a shame. I mean, I love. Uh, we have a we have a um, a venue which is in Houston. It's a beautiful beautiful building we have a lovely mm. staircase it's a nice club room it's a nice small theater it's even it's tight i mean it's it's it, it would be equivalent to a fringe theater space it really is and it just it's a shame that it doesn't have that facility and even you know the castle has the the palace and it has uh, it has a stage that you can do illusions on and we need that. I think I think people would be aghast, especially foreign magicians, maybe. And again, I'm not knocking the magic circle. It's a great lecture facility. But I think they'd be aghast to find out that we host the magic circle stage magician of the year in a venue that's three floors up. And the only way to get props up there is up a spiral staircase, which is very small, or a very, very small passenger lift, very small. And then once you go up the lift, you've got to carry it down a corridor, down two other small flights of stairs to get to the stage. Yeah. And for somebody that's done very, very big illusions, something as big as a sub trunk would cause you incredible problems to perform at the magic circle we one of the things that's come out of the lockdown thing as well and across the board the castle the circle all these small clubs as well it's pushed online it's pushed that side of things and suddenly the people who said it would never work it should never happen are loving it and one of the real positives, I think, as well, and I think it will stay, is the fact that the people who join the Magic Circle from all around the country, or the world even, suddenly feel included. They're suddenly part of it. And I think that's been a wonderful um, aspect. And this that we've pushed forward the technology. I mean, just generally, technology has... I think push forward three to five years in the in the eight months that we've been in, in, in this situation. Suddenly, the rate of of advancement is unbelievable, and some and we can see that that value. Be, and I think the fears were pirating um, accessibility to people who shouldn't be seeing it. But unfortunately, we're living in a world now where. And I saw that, I've noticed this the other day um, on YouTube, there was a, a very well-known magician who just reveals magic, just teaches you magic on YouTube. And I, I, I was a little bit taken aback by it. Um, I don't think there's a way around it anymore, uh, unfortunately. I think, peop, you know, you can go on YouTube every time someone's on Penn and Teller, there's a, somebody else hear the real secrets behind their trick and so suddenly in a way what that does is it says the secrets are the not the important thing um because you can you can buy your products you can you can go and find out how they're done i just put your name in i can go and and buy your tricks and find out how it's done but who cares because it's not important that's not what people are buying Exposure is always going to be a big problem, and there's always that balance between what is teaching and what is exposure, and it's always going to be difficult. It's always one of those hard and fast rules with the magic circle that you don't expose magic unless there's some kind of payment wall or payment barrier or at least some form of effort that people have had to put in to learn the magic. And I think magic as a craft, as an art form, is something to be respected. 
and I think it shouldn't be easily attainable. And the way I see it with regards to exposure is if you think so little of the craft of magic that the secrets should just be available without any barrier in place, then I do not welcome you as a member of the magic circle personally. We're in a problem situation now because that's the reality. So that if you do type in um, latest episode of Penn and Teller Fool Us or you look up Paul Daniels chop cup routine or you will find the secrets. It's, it's just there. It's so there is no barrier to it anymore. I mean, I was watching funnily enough, speaking of Paul Daniels, I was watching that routine, um, which I, I would suggest that anybody's interested in magic in any way, shape or form watches chop cup routine. Cause it's one of the most, I watched, I showed it to a friend the other day. One of the most stunning pieces of magic timing. In fact, it the the secret is so irrelevant because it's everything else that he does that is just st- the the speed and patter of the, the and silence. It, it's stunning. One it's of the most perfect. Yeah. And I saw Paul present it live many many times. And one of my greatest regrets is on our review show. Once we went down to interview Paul, we spent all I spent a few days at his house, actually, at different times. Uh, But on one particular day, I was there all day filming when his new DVD project came out with Luis de Matos. And he I had a, a Ken Brook chop cut. And he engraved it with his signature. And his signature looked just the same as on the old Paul Daniels magic show, where it had his signature across the marquee. It was just the same. But he engraved it on the chop cut with an engraving tool. And I can't believe, I could almost kick myself every single day that we gave it away as a prize. I really wish I'd kept that and framed it. It's one of my greatest regrets in magic is that I gave that cup away and uh, whoever's got it, I'll, I think I'd buy it back off you at the right price because uh, yeah, I regret giving that away as part of a competition, but that routine, like you say, Paul, it was perfect. And the thing was he could bisect an audience with it. He could go out, he could put that cup down and he could speak to every single person in a theater and take the whole room area by area and bring you all in. And that was his standard opener for years. And it was amazing. I saw him perform it at the Savoy Theatre at the right time in my career to just have a bit of a kick up the backside about what live magic could do to an audience. And I think we all, we've all can think about these inspirational performers we saw at just the right time that kind of shape our careers. Yeah. And Paul Daniels was definitely one of them for me, especially as a live performer. Incredible. And and one of the things I, I, I thought about watching him now and the Paul Daniels magic show is it's, it's that one camera kind of feel he's on stage and it's, it's honed down and it's with a real audience there's nothing clever going on. There's, it doesn't need to keep cutting. It doesn't need a million angles. It's a, it just needs to be locked on him doing that thing. And it works. It works on TV and it works on the computer and it works on the internet. And it, it, it kills any of the other stuff that you're seeing now. There's no room for fraud in it. There's, there just isn't. It's absolutely perfect perfect well i think probably like you is probably where you're heading on this point i think it's probably going to come back yes and i think certainly in the uk it's time for another style of magician that's less street more sort of theatrical who can hold an audience on a saturday night that's got the right skills as a magician that could come back and make themselves a name 
certainly in the UK, and you you can almost sense that the British public is ready for somebody to come and talk to them again Mm. and actually perform and talk to them. And I can see it happening, and I can see it being a really, really positive show. Maybe earlier on in my career when I was doing lots of television work, it would have been something that I would have loved to have had the opportunity to try. And it was certainly a dream for a while. But at the end of the day, you have to put dreams on one side and you have to pay the bills and you go in that corporate direction or wherever you're heading that's going to pay the bills. But at the end of the day, I still find myself thinking back to being that 14-year-old boy practicing magic in the mirror in the bedroom, thinking, I wonder if one day I could be full-time and be a professional. And ever since then... I often think back and think that's all I ever wanted in life was to be a professional magician. Money was something that I never really wanted. It wasn't something that I went after. Success wasn't something that I went after. I just wanted to be able to perform magic Mm -hmm. as a job. And there it's, it's, I've had lots of expensive illusions over the years, but there's there is a video of me on i think it's on youtube but it's definitely on vimeo and if you google david penn the star you'll see me on stage in quite a big theater and i'm doing one trick for a young girl in the audience and for me and i don't say this about anything any other performance that i've done But for me, that was the moment everything came together. And I was lucky to have a a really good friend of mine, a fabulous magician, Jamie Allen, that came to my show because we're just friends. And he videoed it that day. And it's me performing this effect. It's an effect of Dan Harlan's, but I put my own script together and I changed the ending. And it's really special. I thought about the background music, the way the girl went off at the end. And... I often think that was the moment it all came together, the years of experience, the theatrical technique, and it was perfect. And the fact that as a magician going back to the Chop Cup, you could hold a theatre of nearly a thousand people with a paper towel. And that's what magic is for me. And the fact that you would get a gasp at something so small something so incidental, but you as a performer have made that important to every single person that's watching. If you can do that, and it doesn't happen to me every performance, but if you can do that, that for me is when you've made it as a magician. I remember seeing your lecture, and I think I saw it quite a few times actually, and you did it at the Magic Circle. It was a fabulous lecture, and there was... What was great about it, and what's great about your magic and the your development of your magic, is it's real worker stuff, and yet it's not, oh, buy this and you can do it. You know, it's you have to invest. You have to invest in the magic. And for me, that's the best magic. And I mean invest in terms of thinking about how you want to absorb that trick. Not how you've seen someone else do it, but how that is important to you and what you can... Your tricks allow the performer to bring out their personality and to bring out their originality. I remember you did something with a hole in the table with an acne hole and billiard balls. Wow, that was a while ago. Yeah, I remember... I was quite. A, there's a load of things, uh, coin bending, and um, uh, how you produced a bottle, how you produced uh, drinks. You know, you took ideas that existed and and jazzed on them and and improved them and developed them. Um, and I think I think that's you know that's really interesting. And 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 you you ended up in a with a with a magic shop. 
Yeah, I don't I still don't know how that happened. That came out of a friendship with a guy called Jim Trainer that was the inventor of the PK ring for magicians and he saw me at an event and he saw me do the bending wine glass actually at a corporate event but he was there at a get, as a guest because we lived in kind of the same area about 10 miles away and he saw me at an event at Cywell Aerodrome and there was a lot of influential people from the local area business owners that kind of thing and he saw me do the bending wine glass we ended up talking and then I told him about my idea for the coin bending trick coin vexed and he he really wanted to bring it out but first of all he didn't know how the bending wine glass worked and I explained to him that it was my thinking and the fact that the glass bent in the spectator's hands and the company at the time and still is called world magic shop even though i own it now uh, said would i be interested in bringing the dvd out so i produced it i went over to ronnie j piper's place in spain the house of illusion filmed all the the demonstration of rodney filmed a stage version of it as well and that went on to dvd and it sold really well and I made some good money from that DVD and Jim was really fair to me with his deal. And then he said, how about the coin bend trick? Let's make it, let's do it. And it was only a concept because I knew it would work. And then he got it all produced for me. And then I worked it for about six months because I, I needed the time to make sure that it was working. And it got to a point where magicians were ringing me up and saying, I've just met somebody at an event and they told me that they've seen you and this coin bent in their hand. And I realized that we had to get it to market fast because other people were thinking of ideas and thinking of ways they could probably do it. And so we brought it out and it just sold phenomenally at Blackpool that year. I, I was just blown away by what an effect could mean. And I think... It's hard to use the phrase yourself without sounding really big headed. But I think especially in the UK, coin vexed has become kind of like a modern classic. A lot of people do perform with those particular gimmicks. And it is amazing the fact that people have bought these tricks and routines and things that I've come up with. But most of the time I came up with them because there were things that excited me my design of the top it i wanted to do more with a top it so i created top it 180 which you could do a lot more with vanish steel and ditch and they were all born out of necessity and i think a lot of magicians when they have gigs will just go and trot out the same material whereas i tend to think about every single gig and i tend to think about what I could do that will have a real impact at that gig. And I'll end up creating an effect, especially for one particular client, just to blow them away. And I remember at one event, I only ever did this trick once and it was amazing. And I should do it more because the reaction was incredible. But I had a wine bottle and a clear Coca-Cola bottle, and they went into a paper bag, and you could hear them. And then I pushed them together, and then the wine bottle came out, and the bag was screwed up. But then the glass Coke bottle was inside the wine bottle, and they got to keep the wine bottle with the glass Coke bottle inside. And you can probably guess, being a magician, how the method of worked of the glass coke bottle disappearing but the fact was because it was set up to do that finale when they went in the bag you heard the sound and it was even more of a convincer right and you just had to vanish the other bottle right screw up the bag yeah and then reveal this ending great and that was just something that i made up for one particular client that was launching a their own range of wine and it had their label on and that kind of thing. And I went to them and yeah, there, there are lots of times where I've, I've gone that extra mile, you would say to create that individual piece of magic. 
And I'm always thinking about magic. And like we said about creating new material, I'm never satisfied with the same show. I always want to try something different, try and push the envelope a little bit more. And maybe that's to the detriment of my act. When you hear about people like Marvin Roy, for example, that perform the same 15, 20 minutes for 30, 40 years of his career, and you think about how polished it was, maybe I've missed that opportunity to be incredibly polished. But what I have developed over the years is this encyclopedic knowledge of different presentations and routines because I have literally tried everything from illusions down to close-up tech magic with mobile phones but I think you will I I, I think there's a problem with the uh, the 15 or 20 minute that actually honed the super honed effect the, the, the super honed act and it becomes tired and I've seen it I've seen it so many, with great magicians yeah. and I've I've seen them and I'm like really really and what happens, I think, is, is, you know, I've said this before, but, you know, we are not our, we are not ourselves at 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. We are versions of ourselves. We are different versions of ourselves. So if the 30-year-old version v- visits the 15-year-old version, we're not the same person. We, we have elements of the same person, but we change and develop, and hopefully we develop. Hopefully we move on. Hopefully we become something else. And so even the patter that we came out with at 20 does not suit the 40-year-old. And you see it with the young magicians trying to be Darren Brown. You can't be Darren Brown at, at, at 15. It just doesn't work. You know, I can, I can hold a, a, a mind-reading effect very convincingly because of the the weight of experience that i have and and the, the 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 intensity that i can i can convey you can't do that at 15 you can you can do it but you've got to think what is it to be 15 that's important what is it to be 25 that's important what is it to be 40 what is it to be 60 and so you, unfortunately you see you know it's good it, you know, you know when you reach a gig and you've forgotten the thing that you were going to do, you you packed it, you didn't pack it, and you were so looking forward to doing it, and you've yes. left. You know, you were going to do some great mind reading thing, and you like, oh, it's going to be great. That's what they wanted, and you've gone in your bag, you're like, oh my god, it was the thing they wanted as well, and I haven't got it, and now you've really got to you've got to dig deep, and you got to think, well, how can I, what can I do? What am I going to do? Pull out a deck of cards and and work it out mate and and so you've got to dig deeper and then suddenly you go you know what i'm glad i didn't bring that thing because i was you know i was going for the tried and tested and now i had to think on my feet and actually i came out with something you know uh and 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 that and that those those are the moments where you go this isn't this is a great game this thing this is fabulous yeah, it's good. Anything that forces you to be creative was always a good thing. Wayne Fox on his, uh, on when he's spoken in lectures, he's talked about a situation where I was helping him with his stage show. He's putting on a one man show, and I was there in the capacity of his consultant on that day. And it meant a lot to Wayne to be doing this one man show. It was meant to be in the West End. Uh, like literally, I think it's two weeks ago, it was meant to be in the West End of London. And he got a short run there with the short, same show. And he had a prediction chest as his first half finale. And it was a well-known prediction chest method, as I'm sure. It wasn't my idea to include it in the show. In fact, I think even Wayne would say it was probably a crutch for him because he knew it was a good finale. He knew it was a good first half close. It was something that he'd used before. And he had a lot of fresh material that he was working on just for this show. But on the day of the show, the prediction chest, everything about it meant that it couldn't work. It wasn't going to be in the show. Because of the methodology involved, something had failed and it it wasn't going to be in the show that night. So during the day... I said, right, this is what we're going to do. And we changed the show a little bit. And I created a brand new method where the scroll 
was signed by a member of the audience, left in full view in the middle of the stage on a chair in full view. And then he did all these same tricks that he planned to be in the Malloy prediction chest at the end. But instead, he went and just picked up the scroll at the end of the show, got the signature confirmed, then unraveled the, the scroll. And I don't mind telling you, Wayne swore that we'd take the secret to our grave, but it fooled every single one of his magician friends that were in the audience that night. Nobody had any idea. And I know that Wayne, that method, how he did it that night is the method now. And it's how Wayne is going to do it in his show when his show What the Fox comes back because it's superior to the chess. Oh, fantastic. But but it was created out of necessity. It forced forced me on that day to be creative. Necessity being the mother of um, necessity being the mother of invention, as they say, and it's true. I mean, you know, we we did that with Max's show um, when we did the, the show at the Circle, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and the, not the not the Sorcerer's Apprentice, the uh, signature tricks, and uh, he, he wanted to sit on somebody uh, for his musical interlude and for one of the tricks and it, it was a bad idea and I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I said you've got to come up with something else and he, he was furious as a, as a friend as a friend of Max isn't it our job to just talk him out of the bad ideas my, as much as we can the, and we probably we probably succeed on three out of five maybe it's the other the other two the other two still make it (laughs) absolutely Uh, absolutely you um uh so you you ended up with this this magic shop um and and eventually uh, unfortunately jim passed away and you were really involved with this uh this magic shop and you but i notice now well I notice now that it, it, it only sells original effects. It's not a it's not a dealer uh, for yeah. other magicians uh, or magic effects. And but you created this early days, really. One, I think, probably the first online um, review, honest review, very honest yeah. review um, show. And actually, you know, I was saying before we started, but it's one of these things here. It's it, I, I, it'll pop up on my phone, or I'll be in bed and it'll pop up, and and or I wake up and 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 I always tune into the 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 Wizard Magic review, as it was the Wizard product review before, yeah. and uh, it's it's I love it because you, you got Wayne and Sean and yourself, and it's like for me, it's like hanging out with my mates. Uh, <laughs> It really is. It's like that's exactly how it is for me. That's why I do it. We don't make anything from it. I get sent the products sometimes. Sometimes they're things I've genuinely bought because I'm interested in myself, and I'll still give it an honest review, and I'll still tell everybody else whether they should buy it or not. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I just noticed at the time that the only reviews seem to be in magazines and the magazines seem to sugarcoat the magic somewhat. And I was watching a review on BBC, Mark Commode, it was, doing the movie reviews. So I'm always interested in movies. Myself, my dad used to go nearly every week to see a film. So I used to watch Mark's reports and decide what we're going to go and see that week. And it just suddenly hit me one day, there isn't this for magic. And it was at that time Wayne's World had just been out. And I remember thinking, it can't just be this sat across the table talking, even though ironically that's kind of what it's evolved into. It's got to have the banter. It's got to have the fun. And we always tried early days to have that fun element to it. And uh, we probably upset people along the way. In fact, I definitely know we did. Uh, we've been threatened with legal action twice. And <laughs> there's a lot a lot that's gone on behind the scenes of the Wizard Magic Review or the Wizard Product Review, as it was. But it's always 100% honest. And the way I've always seen it is 
me and my mates just chatting and looking at magic tricks. And I think we have, I'm very humble to say, developed a loyal fan base that will tune in every single week. But I don't think they're tuning in to find out about the latest magic. I think they're they're tuning in to see the idiosyncrasies in our characters and how we actually interact. It's kind of like Top Gear. Are people watching the cars or are people watching three mates have a good time with these cars? But it's had to it's and, had to develop a lot. It's had to change and you know, there was a lot of controversy in the beginning, but it was it's interesting. It's like when you try anything new, everybody's got an opinion. You know, everybody thinks they know how it should be, how it should be done. And often the case is you don't know how it should be done. You don't know what it is. You just take that leap of faith and you go, you know what? I'm going to do it in spite of everything. And we're going to make mistakes and we're going to have problems. And it's not going to be 100% what I envisage it to be. But I need to get it out there because only by doing it, it's like you talking about working in the restaurant, you know, getting that stage time, getting that, that, that experience behind you, that it can become what it, it will become. And you can't, you can't predict that. You don't know what it's going to become. And it's, it's you know, the, the, the product review has, has mutated and changed and, you know, gone through a lot of things that you've dealt with along I, the way. I don't think anybody's really brought anything new to the table. I'm not going to use the word copy because there'll always be multiple people that see something and think I'd like to do something similar. But I don't think anybody's really brought anything new to the table that's tried to do a similar style of show. And I'm not sure it's a compliment or not, but there, there's a way to check. And I do find myself checking sometimes. And uh, although the tags people use on YouTube are anonymous, you can Google how to do this. You can find out what tags people are using in their videos and there are people doing other review shows that use the name of our show and our names as presenters as tags for their own videos right. and i think that's a little bit desperate and uh i'm not sure people say copying is a form of flattery but i don't think it's flattery when people do that but for me the show is just a passion you have to be passionate about it to be doing it well, we're coming up for the 11th year now. I remember 10 years was a milestone. And I never, ever thought it would be something that would last that long. But there's so much magic that comes out. Not all of it is great. And it's just fun to talk about it with your friends. And it's like me and you today, Paul. We didn't plan what we were going to talk about, but... All of a sudden, the things that are interesting me are coming up and hopefully things that are interesting the viewers. And that's what happens when I sit down with Wayne or Sean and I talk about magic. We end up talking about something else that we do that's working so well or why we don't think that works. Or in the case of today's show that's just gone live, I'm, I'm talking about somebody I saw doing a pendulum routine that when I was 15. And I didn't know how a pendulum worked. And it's important to reiterate that to the viewers, that although something looks simple and gimmick, gimmicky in the right hands as, and the right performer, it can actually be something that's quite powerful, as it was the first time I saw somebody doing a pendulum routine, even though this particular product could be perceived as a real pile of crap, to be honest with you. But you have to remember and you have to impart that experience on the viewers. And I would hope that's why people are watching. I get texts from people or Facebook messages every single day a Wizard product review goes out, a Wizard Magic review. People saying, I can't believe you said that. I can't <laughs> believe you said that about the castle. Uh, as in today's show. And it's just a joke. It's just banter. And they're the things that make it for me. And of course, because I'm the one that edits it, I end up watching it sort of two or three times as I'm checking it as much as 
I can humanly stand to do by watching it through multiple times and checking all the edits and the titles on there. And I genuinely find myself laughing at bits that Sean said or things that Wayne said. And they're inevitably things that just came up in the moment. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, to, to discuss with you was the, the, the journeys that you've been on. Uh, I mean, and literal journeys. So we, we, we touched on it earlier, but magic unlocks incredible experiences. You get to meet people that you would never meet. You get to walk into doors that, you, you know, a magician, the wonderful thing about being a magician is you can get into anywhere. You really yeah. can. Uh, tell, like You've got some crazy uh, experiences. Well, there are things that I've done to just been invited to places. I performed at Buckingham Palace twice, at the Queen's birthday party for her and her private guests. That was an amazing opportunity. But one that springs to mind when you, when you say this about where I literally had to pinch myself and say, how did I get here? There was a, an established member of the Magic Circle called John Derris. And I really hope John is watching this because he's he's in later life now. But uh, John gave me probably the best experience I've ever had. And he probably doesn't know this. In all my career, this this was just an amazing experience. I just won the Magic Circle Close-Up Magician of the Year. And John took some Magic Circle members and friends of his over to Istanbul turkey for a very high level corporate gig and it was for star television and it was for a big anniversary of theirs and i think that's the main network in istanbul and your viewers in turkey would be able to confirm that and it was set up a bit like the brit awards was years ago do you remember paul when they had the brit awards and they'd have like the stadium seating at the back And then at the front, they'd have tables, Mm -hmm. uh, gala sort of setting with about 50 tables and all the high level celebrities and guests are around the tables. But they still have an audience going up the back, but separated with barriers and minders and that kind of thing. Well, myself and Peter Metab, (laughs) another great close up magician, we were tasked by John to wear the triple A pass and perform close up magic in this front area. And we were the only ones in this cabaret area at the front. And I'd never been to Turkey. I'd never seen any Turkish TV. And I didn't know from Adam who anybody was, but I had, as we do when we're sort of close up magicians you have your little base off to one side where you might have your bag of bits and replenishables for the show. And I got chatting, as you do at any event, with the staff that can make or break your performance, the waiter. And there was one guy that, although he was Turkish, he was fluent, absolutely fluent in English. And I think he'd been living in England for some time before returning to Turkey. And I was speaking to him. And I would go up to a table and perform, come back to my bag area, and he would say, do you know who that was? And I would go, no. And he'd say, well, there's a soap. It's like (laughs) Coronation Street, but in Turkey. It's on every day. Everybody watches it. That crowd there, that's the cast of that show. Everybody knows them. And I'd go to another table. I'd come back. and He'd go, do you know who those guys were? (laughs) And he'd say, that's the manager and the top players from the Galatasaray football team. Anyway, I went up to one table and it was really bizarre because you mentioned it earlier. Something I used to do a lot in my act was a bottle production. And I went up to one table that was literally front and center of this whole gig. It was literally the top table. And I went up, introduced myself as the magician. And this one guy stopped the whole flow of performance. And he said to me, show me a trick with a bottle. And I thought, 
this is weird. I thought, has he, and I thought, no, I've not done it. I've been told that this is the top table. I've not done the trick yet. So how does he know that I'm going to do the bottle production? But he, he makes this really out there demand, show me a trick with a bottle. So I kind of start the act, do the four coin roll down flourish, and then I produce the bottle. And everybody at the table goes wild and he sits down, he, he, he reacts to it. And then I perform some other bits in the material. I'm about to leave and the guy says to me, sit down. So I sit down at the side of him and he says, I'm a magician. I go to Davenport's. And I said, oh, Davenport's, amazing. And he said, do you know a trick called bottle through table? <laughs> and I said, I do, yes. And as we know, there are times in your career that you might buy bottle through table if you're a little bit too young and experienced and you wouldn't know what to do with it. And there are times in your career when you understand it, as did I. Anyway, it transpired that this particular gentleman was a fan of magic. He was a hobbyist. He'd been to Davenport's. He would bought bottle through table, but he didn't know what the trick looked like. He just couldn't get it into his head what it was. This was before DVDs, before video instructions. He had the little piece of paper that came in the box. And when he challenged me, he said, do a trick with a bottle. He was hoping that I would do bottle through table. And he would get to see it. And I explained to him that it wasn't a trick that I performed, but I gave him some help with it. It was obvious that he was knowledgeable about how the effect happened. But I sat down and gave him some instruction. He said his name. He asked my name again. Said, thank you very much, David. And he did introduce himself. And I shook his hand. Anyway, I went back to my reset area and the guys go oh my god do you know who that was you were literally sat with him for 15 minutes do you know who that was and i was like no and he said that's the president of turkey <laughs> and i just thought okay right well i i didn't know and i just went and did some more tables anyway this night is unbelievable. Fast forward an hour, you've got Enrique Iglesias in support on stage, and then Whitney Houston. Whitney freaking Houston, right? <laughs> there is only, me and Peter are at the back right now having some food with the guys, but we've got the only AAA passers. So Whitney Houston's about to come on, and I said to Peter, come on, Peter, let's get down the front. We've got the passers, right? So me, when Whitney Houston starts, it's all the up-tempo numbers. And if I said she was on stage, I would be misleading you because she was up three carpeted steps from the tables, which were cabaret. Now, when she came on, it was all the up-tempo numbers, like I want to dance with somebody and songs like that. So everyone was up dancing. So me and Peter naturally just joined the crowd down the front. The the security staff looked at our passes. We had triple A's, no problem. So we're dancing down the front with all these celebs, me and Peter met up. Anyway, <laughs> she changes the pace in the set about 20 minutes in, and she starts to talk. And just like any event at the Grosvenor House or anybody like that, when the tempo goes down, the dance floor gradually clears. Peter shot off very quickly because he didn't want to kind of get exposed that we were in this area and we weren't actually guests. But it was just such an amazing experience. We had to take advantage of it. Everyone was sitting down at their seats. And I got to a point where I thought, I've just got to go now. And just as I was about to leave, the president of Turkey calls me and he goes, David, come and sit with us. <laughs> so <Yay. laughs> I sat down thinking, well, I won't tell you what I was thinking, but he said to me, do you want some wine? And he poured me wine 
And that was the night I got to sit at the front row, <laughs> listen to Whitney Houston, 12 foot away from me, entertain this whole like stadium room environment whilst the president of Turkey poured me wine. And that was certainly a moment when I thought, oh, my God, how did I get here? And it was incredible. Full circle from the toy soldier appearing. Yeah. Well, I think that's a a fabulous moment to end on, really. I don't think how we can top Whitney Houston and uh, the president of Turkey. <laughs> I need to, I need to get in touch with John. And John, if you're watching this and you get to see it, I know Paul shares this in the Magic Circle group. If you get to see this, I know Chris Wood speaks to you a lot as well. Uh, if you've got some photos, I would really like to see photos of that night, that room, because I have got nothing, just my own memories. Well, I think that's a special... I think, you know, I don't know, it's... It's a weird thing, isn't it? It's the memory, the, the world we live in now where it's all videoed and photographed and it didn't happen unless there's a iPhone picture of it. And yet, you know, so many of the things we do are NDA or, you know, you're not allowed to uh, take photographs or talk about. Um, and it's, you know, you're, it, it's a fabulous career. Um, it's wonderful that you're still... And you, you genuinely still have this passion for it and this, you know, uh, you're a wonderful person to, to, to talk to, especially if you want to come up with ideas, the consultancy brain that you have on things. I mean, I've been with you in the, the circle. I remember it was, oh God, it must have been last year and you were obsessing about Rubik's Cubes and yeah. we, we, we talked for, oh God, it must have been an hour, 40 minutes about every single version of rubik's cube magic and you were playing with idea i mean it's 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 amazing and you you still have that childlike fascination i think at that time i was working for maddox dixon as his consultant for britain's got talent he got to the semi-finals that year and it was a big part of maddox's act so as a consultant, it was my job to kind of immerse myself in it. And sometimes you immerse yourself in something for a client and it might be something you'll leave behind after the job. But with the amazing products that are coming out all the time from the likes of Henry Harrius, especially, uh, you, the, the sort of thing that is popular now with Rubik Cube Magic is incredible. And it's got something that every single magic trick doesn't normally have. And that's a good hook. And it's got an emotional hook and something that makes people revert back to that childlike age because everybody's held a Rubik cube and it symbolizes impossibility to most people. So the fact that you can incorporate that into a corporate energizer or conference speaking act, it kind of, nearly always embodies the message that your client's asking you to impart on their delegates during that day's event. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's, <laughs> it's fascinating. I mean, we could go on forever, really, with all the different elements. I just, I, there's one thing that came to mind. You were at the David Blaine show, weren't you? I was. You know, we were talking about that simplicity and... Fantastic show. Check yet again for the second time in his career, change the game. Change the game of what a magic show in a theatre of the Apollo, that size, that scale, could actually be. But you have to be a person that the audience is invested in and that character, David Blaine the character, is something that people have bought into and deservedly so. And that's what they came to see that night. They came to see that clearly well-defined character perform these incredible stunts. And those stunts are small, but they're shocking. They're engaging. You become emotionally involved with every single thing that he does. And as from day one, when David Blaine first appeared on the scene, it was the simplicity of the performance that drew you in. And nothing changed. And yet he did change the game once again. Yeah. There are those, there are those, you know, we've touched on the Paul Daniels, David Blaine. We haven't even touched on Darren, who definitely changed the game again. 
and yeah. continues to do so. Um, and they are few and far. And, and you know, I suppose Dynamo did as, as well in a different way, um, in a kind of reinvention. Uh, it, it you know, for me, it's not the same, um, but you you have to hand it to him. You know, he he changed the game again for another generation. I think. Yeah, there are lots of people that have genuinely been game changers. A, a good friend of mine is Chris Angel. I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves for his style of show, but a lot of TV magicians have adopted that format now. And Chris really created a format that was quite unique because it was the first reality-style magic show where you thought you were investing in somebody's life, their career path. You were seeing their brothers, their mothers, their friends, following them around their entourage and the life outside the show actually became the show and it felt like this reality show experience but at the same time you were still experiencing magic and people like Steve uh, Banachek that worked on that show really came up with something quite innovative in the way that it actually drew you in as a viewer and even now those shows stand up and you had obviously Copperfield uh, in the 90s, a complete game changer, absolutely changed the game. But then there's been so many other people that have come along since. They haven't copied Copperfield. They've found their own way to present magic on television. And I think Chris really did come up with something that's not normally acknowledged by magicians, but I really feel it should be because that reality style of magic show, he was incredibly ahead of his time. There weren't any shows like it, like the Kardashians at that time. Reality wasn't really taking off. He was ahead of the game as far as television is concerned. We were at Magic Live last year and in Vegas, and you, I think you'd seen, you went and saw the Chris Angel live show. I, I, I believe you've seen it many times. Um, I've seen it many times, yeah. yes. But it was a really significant one. I remember you saying it, it was one of the best, if not the best illusion show you, you'd seen, I think. Am I right in saying that? I th- I think the show that he does now is is the best show that I've ever seen of illusions, and I I take serious offence when somebody it says about Chris's show not being any good, but they haven't been to see it, right. and you really need to go and see it before you judge. And what he's doing now is incredible. I took Wayne Dobson one night to uh, a Mike Sullivan came along and a few of my close friends to see his show a couple of years ago. And Wayne said the levitation that he does in the show is the greatest illusion that he'd ever seen. And as far as I'm concerned, it really is because it looks real. It looks incredible. And I've never known Chris. I've seen Chris's show when he doesn't know anybody's in the audience that's taking a special interest. And every single time he delivers 100%, he cares so much about his audience and he cares passionately about his show. And you can't say that about every single magic act in Las Vegas, in my opinion. That's certainly the vibe they give off when I've seen them perform. And, yeah, I'm very humbled to say that a couple of effects that I've created Uh, Chris is really happy to perform and there was one idea that I showed him in the bar in Magic Live and said this is something that's possible and that's ended up being the finale of his touring show and it's incredible that something I spoke to him about in a bar at Magic Live has taken on a life of its own and become this amazing routine in his stage show, which is incredible, his touring show. And uh, I'm very humbled that a lot of performers have used my ideas over the years, but to have somebody the level of Chris Angel just listen to you, just listen to what you say, and then take a small germ of an idea, and then they put their stamp on it, and it just goes 
incredible. So do you see, um, you know, I, I'm firmly of the belief that as we come out of this uh, crazy time, we're going to go into a, the most uh, creative time that we've seen for uh, decades. Um, I think we're going to have a, you know, a, a literal, it will be a roaring 20s. It will be um, the need, you know, we've realized the need for interaction is the, the the essence of humanity. You know, we are the storytellers. Well, there'll certainly be a lot of films on at the cinema <laughs> because they've been holding everything back. Me personally, although I enjoy performing, my my stepdaughter is coming up for sort of 17 years old now and it won't be long until she goes off to college. So... I think I'm going to take an opportunity. I've had a lot of invites over the years to lecture abroad at foreign conventions. And I think I'm going to be taking a lot of those opportunities and uh, running with them in the future. So if you've got a convention abroad and you'd like a lecture by myself, please get in touch because in late 2021 and 22 and 23, I think that's what I'd like to be doing a little bit more of is, taking my inventions on the road and chatting to magicians. I love lecturing. You've seen me lecture, Paul. Yeah, uh, I love it. Jamie Allen, Jamie Allen says I'm his favourite lecturer, which is uh, great because uh, of how passionate I am when I talk about the ideas that I've come up with over the years. And when I lectured at Magic Live, to have somebody like David Williamson, mm-hmm. David Williamson, literally an idol of mine, say it was his favorite lecture of all of magic live that year when i lectured on the bending wine glass i can't tell you what that meant to me coming from david williamson and it's because i really enjoy lecturing and i believe in the material and if anybody wants to see it and wants to get in touch for a convention or a club lecture or wants to put a little tour together in your country please get in touch yeah, forget this. I mean, I understand the Zoom thing is is ne- is necessary. It's a necessary uh, situation, and it's you know it's unlocked certain things. And I think what will happen is the technology and the understanding that we've gained in this scenario will be valuable. So we can take this uh, virtual world and bring it to the real world, and and have them work together. And I think that will be fascinating. And I think that's where the future is. And I would highly recommend seeing David uh, live um, doing, especially the Thank well you. performances anyway, uh, because you know you know your stuff. And sometimes I, I see little uh, little clips of of tricks that you're doing. Even at a wedding, I saw you doing a goldfish production, and I'm like, oh my god, Dave does that. You know, very few people actually do. It. And you, you, some wonderful, wonderful ideas. And I, I've done the um, the bending wine glass stem in their hand that's because of you in their hands and the methodology to get to that state and i it is genuine there is nothing happening they literally get a real wine glass and it bends in their hand they see the bend it's in it's insane it's incredible it's probably as, as a magician I know everybody uses that phrase. You're an actor being playing the part of a magician. But I think as a magician, sometimes you have things that you do and it might be something on stage. And that that particular bit with the star and uh, the bit that I spoke about on stage, you actually feel like you're really magic. (laughs) And as a performer, you don't get that very often. Sometimes you could be thinking about the drive home or whether the snow is going to start whilst you're actually doing the show, which is absolutely not the wrong, right thing to do, but you find yourself doing it. And then there are other things that you perform in your working set where you absolutely love that moment. And it's because for that one moment, you actually convince yourself and you allow yourself as a performer to feel like you're really performing magic, that magic is real. And when I do the bending wine glass, that is a moment for me. The star with the paper towel is a moment for me, pushing the soaring in half apart, 
when you're in the middle, when you're in that one particular moment, and there's also certain effects like the bending wine glass. And unless you've done it, you don't understand what it means to an audience. But you can have a whole room in a wedding environment and you can start doing that one particular effect, refraction, on the bride and groom, and you're doing it in the bride's hand, and the whole room just falls silent. And you hear the conversation stopping. You're aware that people say, look, watch. And then the odd person might stand up and start videoing or taking a picture. But very few moments in magic without any orchestrated introduction have that ability to sort of catch people's eye and then stop a whole room. And that one piece of magic, because of the theatre, the intimate close-up theatre of this glass bending while somebody's holding it, and everyone can see it going over, and everybody instantly understands what's happened from one glance. It's amazing how magical that is as a performer, and you feel it. You feel it inside, and it's a really special moment. And if you've got one moment like it in your show, if you're a performer, you know what I'm talking about. So strong. Yeah, it truly is. Um, well, I think we're going to end it there. So, David Penn, thank you very much for being my guest today. It's been an absolute pleasure. You see how easy it thank was? Thank you for having me. We just drifted off into a multitude of things, and, and it just happens because... But- 30 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, it's only been 30 <laughs> minutes. Um, uh, we'll end it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>